for us talking. Um, all right, so we'll we'll commence. And now, you know, I like to try and keep on time with these webinars as we do like to have a chat and leave plenty of time for question and answer at the end. And I just wanted to say, first of all, acknowledge the land in which we're meeting today. Uh, for me, I'm meeting here on the Ghana land and I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present and emerging and really pay our respects as we um, contemplate, especially on Remembrance Day today, um, those have come before us and, and really thank you to everyone for caring for this land that we're on today. So what I'll do now is just go through, um, it's been a little while since we've had a COVID-19 GP update and we're all zooming in from our, our computers at home in various places. Um, usually we all sort of crowd together in one room and we have a good um, back and forward banter chit chat, um, but we've decided to be even more COVID safe, which is wonderful. Uh, so I'll go through who our, our main stakeholders are tonight. So Adelaide PHN, and I'm really grateful again to, to Crystal and all the team at the PHN who have allowed us to host another webinar tonight and for their ongoing collaboration with us here at SA Health. Um, the RACGP, so I'm here representing the RACGP. I don't have an extra RACGP panellist tonight um, as Deputy Chair of the State Faculty. And also uh, the AMA SA, and we've got Chris Moy here as President, who's also now, since our last webinar, Vice President nationally now, Chris. So well done on your, on your promotion and election to that really important role. And then we have uh, Dr. Tom Dodd from SA Pathology Clinical Services Director and extraordinaire who has done so much for us here in the state um, for COVID-19. And then finally, SA Health. And I'm really pleased and delighted to welcome Professor Katina Dianez, who's come in as the Executive Director for COVID-19 uh, here in uh, SA Health as part of her usual role as well at Wellbeing SA. And so Katina, welcome to this webinar. It's your first webinar. We've had a number of these. We had them regularly every week and then we went out to fortnightly, monthly, and now it's been about, I think, two months since our last webinar. Thank, uh, thank you. Very, I'm really pleased to be here. Excellent. So what we'll do is we'll start really with, usually we um, Tom would go first and give us a bit of an update of where things are up to. And so Tom, are you happy to lead us off first and tell us a bit about where testing's up to here in South Australia? Sure. Um, thank you, Emily. Good evening to everyone. So in terms of um, where testing has got to, as everyone is well aware, um, testing has continued on uh, in a continuous way with a big peak around August um, and then some tailing off. And one of the messages, of course, this evening is to ensure that we're encouraging everyone who should be having a swab, anyone with symptoms to get swabbed um, to come forward and for you folks to really encourage patients to be swabbed. There's been around 580,000 swabs performed in South Australia, so pathology's done about 500,000. One of the things that I wanted to really highlight this evening though, um, and it perhaps is an issue for patients in a way of promoting them to go and have a swab is that the turnaround times have got faster and faster. So in the laboratory uh, for SA pathology, we have um, been doing further optimization of our testing uh, instruments and have now got the turnaround time within the lab down to about 11 hours all up. But the probably the most important thing is the real-time SMSing of negative results. So previously we had a um, IT platform that helped us send out results and uh, then we had some struggles when the peak of the testing was happening back in August. And we went through a process of SMSing out files of results twice a day. Currently, results are SMSed out within about two or three minutes of the um, result coming off the instrument. So the turnaround time from the patient's perspective has improved dramatically. Um, two things about that. We cease or pause sending out text messages from 9 p.m. It was decided that no one wanted to get a text message necessarily at 2 a.m. in the morning. So results continue to come out uh, till 9 p.m. and then recommence sending those text messages at 6 a.m. For children under the age of 12, rather than sending a text message to the um, mobile phone, uh, what we do is we, we'll ring the, the nominated phone to give the result to um, the parent or, or guardian. Um, probably children over the age of 13 can cope with receiving a text message. So that, that's what's happened largely with um, just 
more and more optimization of the way we're doing testing and delivering results. Um, in the coming weeks, we expect to have some further automation at the front end of capturing the um, demographics and patient details and mobile phone numbers and so forth to make sure those uh, that information is really rigorous, making sure we get the GP's um, details as well. So we're sending copies of reports to you as well. So uh, from my perspective, this is going very well. The other thing that we've been doing a lot of work on in the last few weeks is about contingency planning for surge capacity. So at the moment, we're in a sort of a steady state of testing, but we um, have got quite rigorous plans in place now to be able to escalate testing. And if it came to it, we could reach perhaps something in the order of 100,000 tests a week um, in partnership with the private laboratories. Um, uh, let's hope we don't ever get to that point, but the, the plans are well and truly in place. The other thing I just mentioned that many of you would be aware of, and there's been more talk about um, in the last few days in the media is around uh, these uh, rapid COVID-19 antigen tests, which are obviously different to the current gold standard PCR um, nucleic acid amplification tests, which we're currently doing. So the, the antigen test obviously looks for um, an antigen in the COVID virus. Um, it's technically a bit like um, a pregnancy test, so a swab's taken and a drop of solutions put into a um, cartridge and uh, is incubated for about 15 minutes and that gives a result. The issue with this is that the tests um, lack the sensitivity that we're used to with the PCR tests. So they range from maybe 50 to 95% sensitive. They're also not completely specific either. So in the case of um, low prevalence, like we have currently in Australia and South Australia, um, they, they wouldn't be a reliable alternative for what we're currently doing with the PCR. They may have a place in the future here if we get into a situation of high prevalence um, where they could be utilised in, in a few settings to uh, identify um, uh, positive cases to help uh, triage and manage in uh, remote communities or, or closed environments like prisons and so forth. But in the short term, they're probably not going to have a role um, in a sort of clinical space in South Australia. Nonetheless, we are making preparations um, to potentially have those tests available over the, um, the coming few weeks, um, but don't expect to be seeing them used, um, at least in South Australia, anytime soon. Thanks, Tom. I think that's really good to hear around where antigen testing is is heading, and and certainly it, it does provide a lot of that hope. I know we all heard about it with um with Donald Trump and his outbreak that he had uh, in the Rose Garden, and how that was um, antigen testing was used in that scenario. It, it's it, I guess it's quite helpful from a general practice point of view to sort of see where we see testing heading in the future. Do you see any changes at all in the way that we're currently testing with PCR, moving to any form of more rapid type PCR tests? Is there anything else that we think may become really critical for general practice moving forward? So obviously um, turnaround time's a, a big thing, um, but at least in the moderate future, I think that the current practice using the sort of gold standard um, versus um, RT-PCR amplification is going to be the, the principal way of testing. We, we, we continue to have the um, rapid um, PCR tests, which we are using um, on a regular basis. Once again, we are largely constrained by um, the um, supply of cartridges for those tests. The other thing is, of course, to do wide scale testing, you have to have a, a process that's not constrained. Each of the sort of antigen tests or single, single point tests require a lot of um, manual labour and that can't be sort of uh, scaled up in the way we do with um, the, the sort of uh, laboratory processes currently in place. So I think they're unlikely to be major changes in the short term 
Thanks, Tom. And we, um, I sent out your um, communication as well around uh, serology testing, and particularly now it's come out around the Chinese uh, requirement for travelling to China from the embassy there around the need for serology testing. And it, it's quite interesting. I, I know that you've you've kindly come to the party on that, Tom, in terms of offering that testing to to travellers who are heading back to China, particularly for our students who are heading back. Um, is it? I guess is there any further update at all in the serology space at all that we should be conscious of? I know I'm going to ask a Tina about it later anyway for our positive cases here but is there is there anything else do you think we should be thinking about in this space with serology? Yes yeah, so th thank you for reminding me about that so just for those who may not have um, caught up with this the the um, Chinese government are requiring people traveling um, back to China to have both a negative um, PCR test and serology uh, 48 hours before travel. So it's a very tight time frame. And so what we've got in place for the Metro site anyway is for uh, travellers to present to um, the Royal Adelaide Hospital COVID clinic, ideally through their GP with a request form explaining that they're um, travelling to China and a swab will be taken and blood will be drawn for, for serology. And then the patients will be able to collect hard copy um, reports the next day with a view to travelling the third day. Um, in terms of serology, um, we've obviously had a test now in place for several months and it's been used very responsibly. Uh, responsibly. Um, it's been very helpful, I understand, for the CDCB and I'm sure Katina will make some comments about that shortly. Um, so um, the real issue is the limited um, role in our current low prevalence environment, really, and uh, let's just hope it remains that way. Thanks, Tom. So I think I'll hand over now to you, Katina, around, I think that's an excellent segue in around serology and what's happening here in the state and really where is the future of, uh, with CDCB and how um, COVID cases are being managed here in the state? Uh, thanks, Emily. So, um, and thank you everybody for being here this evening. Um, I guess to start with serology, uh, we find it to be very helpful um, for the situation where we are quite commonly seeing people, um, international arrivals, who've come from very high prevalence countries. Um, and we and uh, the PCR tests that we are doing are incredibly sensitive. Um, and we're able to pick up, well not we, the Royal We, Tom and his team, are able to pick up uh, old infections as well as uh, current new infections. And so we've become quite adept at being able to tell the difference now between old and new. Um, we use features of the PCR test result, but also we that's where we use serology. And we found that to be very helpful, um, helpful for us. But that said, we're still understanding the serology itself. And from a timing perspective, uh, relative to the date of onset of illness, um, what proportion of people we would expect to be positive at any day post kind of day zero. Um, so it's most certainly the case that we're learning all the time and looking at data. And in fact, we've just been discussing today, um, doing an, a formal analysis of all the serology data we have to date so that we can start to understand. But things are changing all the time and we're kind of reviewing them all the time. But that, that's, I think, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else about the serology in that context. No, I, it, it, it's obviously proving a very useful tool for you. And just to remind people with the, the low prevalence in, in the community, if we start um, testing in a sort of a blind way, we'll have far more false positives than, than true positives. Yep. Yeah, we use it in really quite specific circumstances. Um, and it's really just to help us to know about the level of activeness of the infectiousness of the case. Um, I wonder, Emily, if I should talk a bit more broadly about the, the kind of scaling that we've been doing for contact tracing? I think that'd be really great, Katina. And I know there's been a lot of interest from GPs as well around, well, we're seeing a number of cases now here in the state. How, how has it changed now the way that CDCB is handling those cases? But also now, what's sort of the process given that there are so many travellers now coming in who are infectious into the, into the state? Okay, thank you. So... We, um, around three months ago, um, and really post kind of getting over the first wave, we kind of took stock and looked at 
you know, what we needed to do to be ready should what happened in Victoria happen here. Um, and it's, you know, I guess we can very reasonably see that there's a um, skyrocketing infection rate in the rest of the world. So it's really not that unlikely that this is going to be something that we will have to at some stage deal with. Um, and we hope to delay that as far as possible. But nevertheless, we knew that while we had an extremely uh, talented, skilled, dedicated clinical disease control branch who did a fantastic job in the first wave to really stamp out ongoing transmission, that the, what, that the way we were doing business um, and the staffing we had, which was about 10 to 15 people in the contact tracing team who could deal with up to 40 cases a day, um, it was obviously very hard work for them and um, they had to work long hours, but with, that we needed to have a, a more scaled system going forward should we get very large case numbers. So two major things have happened. One is that, well, three really. One, that there's a new kind of section called COVID operations, and that's a unit that's basically dedicated entirely to COVID. And that also preserves the function of the business as, you, as usual CDCB, so that all of those other diseases um, don't get neglected. Um, but the, the COVID operations team started further development on the Salesforce IT system at the start. And so that's really acknowledging that while the traditional, we call it the whiteboard, where we get all the relevant information and everybody discusses the links between cases and then we go from there, would not work should we have 100 cases a day. Um, that there'd be too many, um, too many kind of cases and contacts lost through the cracks. So we needed to digitalize the whole thing, um, which we have done. It was actually in place from around May, but we've been doing ongoing development. And I'll perhaps put that to the side for a second. I can talk a bit more about that in a while. But the other thing we did was train more staff. Um, we're still doing that. We've now got the team up to 90 people. That includes contact tracing staff as well as support staff. It's predominantly contact tracing. Um, we will, by the end of the year, have 150 people in those positions. But additionally, we're training 150 public sector staff and those staff um, are being trained to be part of the contacts management team, should we need them. Because as you can appreciate with every case, there's on average 10 contacts. So it's the contacts that are really the tricky bit to keep track of um, in terms of numbers. So if we had hundred cases in a day, we'd have a thousand contacts. And because they're all in for generally 14 days or longer, you can imagine how the numbers can rise very rapidly. So that's the part of the system that we will be scaling and putting the most number of people within. Um, we will always retain the very high quality case interview process that we have always had and that has served us well for decades. Um, and those people who are expert in case interview will be retained for case interview. So we've made a deliberate decision that those functions that need the highest level of experience and expertise should have experienced and expert staff. And those functions which can be more easily trained in a shorter period of time, semi-automated or standardised should be. So that's how we've got ourselves ready. And we should by the end of December, be all of those systems will be in place. Our Salesforce build will be um, complete, at least for now, um, and we'll have our 300 trained people that we will be able to call on should we need them. I might just stop there because I'm really just talking continuously. That's what I often do, Katina, in these webinars anyway, so you're, you're fitting in with that. Um, no, that's, that's fantastic. Look, I, I guess one of the things we were really quite keen to sort of understand as well as it sounds fantastic that you've moved towards this model, that a lot of GPs worry about what happened in Victoria and worry that something similar could happen here in South Australia. And it was just really sort of understanding what sort of mechanisms are in place to prevent something like that happening. I know we've got directions and all sorts of other restrictions on movement sure. and the borders that exist, but how were we going to be prepared if we did have an outbreak and what sort of surveillance do we have in place as well? Okay, um, so apart from what I've already described, we are using uh, as many sources of information as we can to help us, should we get a large number of cases and need to start prioritising certain cases over others, that we'll have that information that will allow us to do that. Now, one of the ways that we have built into the system 
um, which I'm keen to talk with you all about and to also hear your views, is a system whereby if we need it, we would switch on uh, instant SMS um, text messages or email to, if we have that, to people who've tested positive. So basically, as soon as the lab um, sends the electronic file to CDCB, it gets ingested into our Salesforce system automatically and then automatically sends out a text to uh, the person who um, is the positive case. We will be providing information in that text. In particular, please go home and isolate. Um, and this is how you do so safely. But we'll also be asking people to complete a survey um, in a subsequent text. That text will survey will look at the different significant risk factors for outbreak potential, as well as um, a short sieve on clinical risk. So in that event that we uh, had an extremely large number of cases where we couldn't maintain the gold standard quality, such as what happened in Victoria, we would still maintain for most people the ability for them to know straight away that they're positive, straight away to be isolated. We know that we've had over 90% of people that we send texts to that they do return surveys to us. And so we would imagine that for 90%, we'd also know were they clinically at risk or were they a public health risk for the outbreak. And that way we would prioritise our interviews to those people. Um, we do intend to call people as quickly as possible. Um, and we have a team of GPs who will be doing that function for us in this scaled system. And, and so it is always our intention that we'll be on the phone and speaking to people because we don't want people to fall through the gaps as we have seen happen elsewhere. Um, but the SMS tech system is, is, if you like, our safety net behind the usual processes that we intend to continue. Uh, we're also doing other things like we are linking the, the lab results as they come in, the addresses on the lab results to aged care facility residential addresses and other congregate living residential addresses and any other higher risk residential address or postcode. Um, so that's a way for us to know at the point of notification whether a person for example, we will be able to pick up and the system will flag that we have a positive case in the APY lands. So that way we'll, we'll um, because uh, it may come to pass um, as it did in Victoria, and of course this is not what we want in South Australia, that we would um, basically prioritise our uh, resources to the most high risk individuals um, there would be a group of people as well that we would be able to communicate with electronically in a semi-automated fashion throughout the journey of it being a case. Um, and then there are others that we will just have to call because they're not people who are digit digitally literate. Um, so in a way, we're trying to segment who must be called, who, who doesn't have to be called, and um, you know where the, where's the highest risk. So that's, of course, for when we're in extreme numbers because we're actually planning with our, our scale up to be able to handle quite large numbers, much larger than we did in wave one. Um, but we're getting ready really in case the worst case scenario happens. Um, in terms of the clinical, I mean, uh, Emily, you might actually be best placed to talk about the way CDCB does a bit of an assessment. Our doctors do a first call and talk to people, but then we refer on to um, a community GP and I'll pass you to Emily. Thanks, Katina. That was very helpful. I think it's really good to know then for, for general practice here in the state that you do have that surge capacity and you can really, um, really expand your contact tracing really quickly. So usually Dr. Jenny Gould would be giving an update on where the GP assessment team is at and um, it's Jenny's birthday today. So she's um, she's decided to spend the evening with her kids instead of um, instead of with us, which is fair enough. Um, Jenny's been working um, incredibly hard with the, as the clinical lead for the GP assessment team and also with Jenny Biggins as well now who's taken on a, um, a lead role as well as part of the GP assessment team. And um, we still have the same pathways that we had previously in place back in, uh, that started back in March, which is where we have those large numbers of GPs and many of you are part of this group uh, through GenWise, um, which is now 24 seven Medicare. 
and um, have the ability to manage, um, manage patients at home in the community. And certainly those pathways still exist. I know there was some discussion back when we did have the Febiden cluster around, well, are we still managing people at home or are we managing people in hotels, given we did see a large number move into the hotel system and those close contacts um, went into, uh, into our Medi Hotel. But really those pathways still very much exist and we would be very reliant on that, on that workforce and the wonderful work that, um, that primary care offers in terms of managing, in managing cases. So I think that's exactly right, Katina. Those pathways are still there. We've, we've checked the system, we've, we've tested the system uh, by the fact that we do have quite a few numbers of uh, positive cases, but also uh, the GP assessment team has pivoted now to providing a lot of the a lot of the care in the hotels uh, in our Medi Hotel. So you, you might recall back in um, back in April when we had two repatriation flights from India, we had the South Australian India Medical Association uh, SAMA who were very involved with providing care and were able to um, really ensure that we had excellent systems in place. And then uh, the Indian Medical Association continued that care for many months um, in our hotel system and did such a wonderful job in providing really, really important primary care. What we then realised with our harder border with Victoria was that we were having a, a lot of travellers who did require hotel quarantine because of that risk and we set up a number of hotels. So we had six uh, many hotels which were operating here in metropolitan Adelaide and then also the hotel down in the southeast. And as part of that hotel system, we really needed to utilise primary care and we desperately needed GPs who are so sensible, as you know, and as I know, um, who are so sensible in this space, but also provide so much in terms of the general well-being and support that we know many of these travellers really suffer and desperately need assistance with having come from either lockdowns where they've been coming from in Victoria, but also many months of suffering overseas trying to get back to Australia. So the, the GP assessment scheme is, is so pivotal in this space and it's providing a lot of care to our, our hotel travellers. And I know, um, I have many conversations with Jenny Gould around, around complex travellers who enter our quarantine system. So it's great that we've been able to really test and surge that um, capacity a little bit. So we do know that everyone's kept up their knowledge um, with COVID, even though all our cases are in the hotel, so that if we did have um, um, outbreaks in the community, certainly the GP assessment team would be ready for action. And I'm so grateful for all the support that we've had uh, from Dan Pryor and the team there at, at at 24-7 um, at Medcare. So hopefully that gives a little bit of background of where we're up to with the GP component. And as Katina mentioned, we do have that surge capacity as well as part of CDCB with the, we had um, over 50 GPs who applied to um, come work in at CDCB and we'll soon as well be looking for some GPs to come into our um, state control centre health um, to work as GP liaisons. So we'll send out some information soon around that as well. So what I might do is, was there anything else further you want to talk about, Katina, as well with, with COVID and where we're at? I, I know wastewater is often a common uh, common area that people like to discuss and, and talk through as well in general practice. Is that something we should be thinking about from, from a GP perspective or what should we be telling our patients when they ask us about, about wastewater testing? Well, I think the important thing for people, I mean, we... We are still learning what wastewater testing means. I think that's a that's fair to say um, because there's a lot, well, we're still learning about everything really. <laughs> we're still learning about the PCR test and serology as well. Um, but wastewater, we do have a way to go to really understand what it means. But if we get positive results in the wastewater um, and it's in an area where we wouldn't expect to see positive results, that is there hasn't been a case in that vicinity um, for some time. Now, of course, that can be difficult to know, but nevertheless, um, what that's its intent is to pick up where there might be positives where we haven't actually picked it up in the people. So the main message really is that if we find a, if we get a wastewater sample test positive, then the people who are in that catchment area for that wastewater sample really should be encouraged if they become sick to be tested. Um, and it's really, it's really all about I mean, everything we're doing is all about finding the cases, which is the testing. Um, and so I would, um, I mean, we're always encouraging that. And wastewater testing can be an impetus for some people where they might otherwise have thought there was no chance they could be positive. Um, and so in that regard, if people come to you and they're unwell, I mean, we, we're obviously encouraging testing anyway. But this is, a, I guess, wastewater testing is a way as well to, to remind people that it, that it really can still be there. I just, I did, there was one more thing that I forgot to say, Emily, I've just reminded myself, and that is um, from a control perspective, 
the literature tells us very clearly that we need to have our cases in isolation and all associated contacts in quarantine within three days of onset of the onset of symptoms. Now for that to happen um, and for us, and this is so that contact tracing can be a, an effective tool. So that effectively means that on the day a person becomes unwell, they need to be tested. And then that gives um, the pathology labs time to get the test to us to then allow CDCB to have at least a day, a 24 hour period, um, to interview the case, identify all contacts, find all contacts, because sometimes that's not necessarily a straightforward activity. Uh, and, and I guess direct people into quarantine. So it, it, it really is very tight. Um, but if we, if we don't do it that quickly uh, and, and too many days pass, we actually lose the ability to interrupt onward transmission of the virus. Thanks, Katina. We've had a question posted in the chat box. Yep. Uh, how much wastewater testing is currently happening here in, um, in SA? Um, I, oh, well, there's quite a bit happening. There's multiple sites. I think we could say, Emily, maybe 10 or 15 sites from memory. Um, so there are smattering of across the metropolitan area as well as some country areas. Um, and that testing will increase in the coming period of time. Um, I mean, I think we, we're still working through where, where it makes sense to be putting wastewater testing and also where it's possible to do it because there are, as you can imagine, you need to have kind of ways to pull the sewerage into one area to make it feasible. Um, yeah, but it will, it will evolve over time, I'm sure. And in six months time, you know, a lot of the stuff that's a little unclear to us now, hopefully will become known. Thanks, Katina. That's excellent. What I might do then is move on to Chris, because um, I know you're going to talk a bit about vaccination, Chris, and I'm sure that'll be a topical um, topical conversation. Hopefully, we'll have some questions as well around that um, that then Katina as a well can, um, can assist with. So I'll move on to your slide, Chris, if that's okay. And then I'll come back. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Emily. Look, can I just first up say, I was, I've was i been meaning to say this for a while about how, what a great job Emily's been doing. Um, I think she's spoken of in such great terms by the people I speak to with SA Health. So we really do acknowledge her work. She's, she just has been hosting these things. So somebody needs to say that. So well done, Emily. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say, well, I'll just bring up some AMA sort of um, sort of general practice relevant issues. Uh, the, the things that people are asking about or are wondering about at the moment. Uh, the first is about the telehealth MBS items. Um, certainly we managed to negotiate an extra six month extension to March next year of the current COVID ones, uh, which were obviously mainly because of Victoria, uh, which was uh, imperative. So that's actually bought us some time at the moment. So I'm on this thing called the primary care agreement group and I'm working with Karen Price actually quite closely at the moment walking into the next lot of negotiations um, because it's going to be moderately tense, but everybody would like an early solution, but there probably won't be one straight away. It's going to take a little while to get that. Um, main thing is looking at the numbers and making sure that that, um, that the government can be convinced about it. So we're doing a lot of that at the moment. So I just want to reassure you about that. Um, Beyond that, there is a wider piece of work called, um, and it's a group called the Primary Health Reform Steering Group, which is chaired by two very good people, uh, Dr. Steve Hamilton and Dr. Waleed Jamal. Um, this is about looking at a wider sort of uh, uh, rejig re in terms of funding for general practice and, and uh, whether things can be improved over time. Obviously, we're, we're fighting for more resources, um, but there's a wider, wider look at uh, things like, and you may have already heard that wind about things like uh, nomination, patient nomination and those sort of things. That, uh, but uh, it does fit in with the whole uh, matter of telehealth as well. Um, so be reassured, again, I'm working very closely with people like um, Karen to uh, advocate for general practice to make sure this gets done properly in the longer term. Um, E-prescribing, um, it hasn't come to South Australia, mainly because uh, really most of the efforts have been in Victoria. E-prescribing has really taken off in Victoria because obviously that was the priority. And in fact, several hundred thousand scripts have actually been um, uh, created by a token method in Victoria. Uh, it, we are we are lower down the list, which is probably gonna be in a month or so uh, that we'll start looking at it. Uh, and by that stage, we may also have, I think you may recall that there was initially, there will initially be this token um, method of, 
providing scripts, which does have a couple of issues that people have found. Just managing these tokens is a has become a complex thing for some for some patients, especially if they have a large number of, of prescriptions. Uh, but behind that will be this thing called an active script, which will essentially be the um, scripts in a list sitting up in 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 the cloud, uh, which we we just approve it, and basically that means a continuation of the scripts, and that can be accessed by the pharmacist, and then the prescription can be provided. So that that's going to come on quite soon after tokens, and that may actually turn out to be a much better way of doing it, a little bit less clunky. But having said that. I think tokens are still better than faxing those bits of paper everywhere and uh, sending them off as well. So, you don't know, I think uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing a lot more of it in South Australia. Um, I'm actually on this thing called a medicine shortages working party. I just want to reassure that many of us as GPs have seen a lot of medicine shortages um, in various areas. Um, I, for one, have been particularly concerned about things like the H2 antagonists, the ranitidines and the like, ever since ranitidine went off because of the, the sort of carcinogen that was associated with it. And then suddenly we couldn't get any of the others. And it's been a real problem for some of our patients, particularly those who've had problems with the proton pump inhibitors. Um, so look, there is work up, it's actually exposed Australia a little bit into being a little bit behind in terms of having good reporting mechanisms and then mechanisms to be proactive and filling in gaps. But, and also the fact that we, you know, we're limited in the medications we, we provide, but I think there is a wider debate in the longer term about the um, medication, medication manufacturing security uh, as along with a whole number of things like PPE production and, um, um, and those sort of things. So it, it's a big piece of work which is going on at the moment. So it's not something that people are just letting go. Um, AMA has been really involved in the PPE side of things. Um, we have been uh, really pushing very hard for a higher standard of PPE uh, protection for health workers, um, mainly because of uh, to, to look at it from a health and safety point of view rather than just a public health point of view, which I believe we do need to look at that. So there's a fair bit of uh, work in that area. Um, just briefly about the COVID vaccine. Um, look, that, that is another topical area and I'm not going to get into the um, the, uh, the, the science of it, because honestly, um, there are just so many horses in the race on this one. And I think that uh, we, we're getting uh, uh, bipolar disorder with the uh, one minute, or especially the share market, I think with the bipolar disorder, with the reactions to the various uh, vaccine start, uh, trials and every time there's a problem with it and it goes down again. So I think the debates about who gets it um, and you know maybe health workers, for example, and who gives it now that I think the health minister has come out today. Greg Hunt has come out and said it's going to be hospitals, GPs, and um, uh, respiratory clinics. So that is the line at the moment that we'll be giving it. But that leads on to a whole number of other things, which is cold chain transport and storage issues. You, you may be aware that the, the Pfizer one, which has been in the news the last couple of days, has significant uh, complications in terms of the fact it's an mRNA vaccine that needs to be uh, uh, mainly uh, deep frozen at a very low temperature. And then um, after it comes out of that, it needs, can only be used. Now, initially it was only thought to be a few days could be used after that in a um, uh, within a fridge, but it looks like it may be okay for two weeks, but that still puts a hell of a lot of pressure on us in terms of getting the, um, you know, the matching, the, uh, the um, obtaining of the vaccine to the uh, administration. Uh, another thing that a lot of people have been concerned about is the indemnity. Um, uh, that that uh, we've actually had a lot of calls about this, uh, the concerns about the indemnity and patients coming in and saying things like, I want to uh, say that I want to refuse the vaccine now, which is given the fact we haven't actually got the vaccine, it's a, they're getting a bit ahead of themselves. Um, now, uh, look, um, there, there's several levels of this. Um, the Pharmacy Guild, interestingly, the indemnity Pharmacy Guild have come out and said they will not provide uh, unlimited indemnity for pharmacists providing the vaccine, which has made it, made it complicated for pharmacists at the stage. Um, we're actually looking at it. So I've actually been speaking to the indemnifiers over the last couple of days, and we're just going to take this a little bit further. Uh, there's going to be issues about the way we consent things as well, so that people are able to be consented quickly, especially we're having this, you know, very hard to... Uh, a vaccine which could deteriorate very quickly. And we, we need to be able to um, not, you know, we're having to uh, vaccinate a large number of people. We can't have a situation where we're spending hours and hours uh, getting consent, sitting there get, trying to get consent and then uh, not be able to vaccinate enough people while we're, these things are defrosting as we speak. So um, th this indemnity thing is gonna be quite a big, big matter, which we're, we're working on at the moment. I think the other thing to keep in mind is I'm not, 
I think there's a general feeling that um, there's that uh, despite all the talk about COVID normal and stuff by the government, I don't think that this vaccine necessarily means we're going to go back to normal life for a while. So I wouldn't be that 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 uh, banking on that too too too. Uh, this is going to take a while, and you know some of the vaccines, for example, I think that the the AstraZeneca vaccine are just hoping that it works for twelve months, for example. So and at, at, at maybe well, this hopefully getting fifty percent effectiveness, but that it uh, works for twelve months, which isn't you know, it isn't exactly. Um, uh, it's got to be helpful, but not necessarily uh, uh, no, uh, we're, we're, that we've got to be totally safe just with that. Um, you may have heard of a thing called, now, probably this is the thing I really want to focus on. Um, there's this thing you may have seen that the government put out, which is a national work framework for reopening, which is this draft document about all, the, and we, we've been pushing very hard for that because we, we did feel that it'd be great to start to get the states to start to work together again. But they have this thing, the aim is to get the whole country to this state called COVID normal by Christmas. Um, uh, the AMA is pretty sceptical about this. We're quite worried about this. COVID normal means basically no restrictions by Christmas, which we basically means that, you know, if something gets going, it's going to be, uh, we don't have that re reduction in movement, which is uh, being so important in reducing the spread of COVID. Um, so it's something just to keep in mind, because I think that, you know, speaking to some of the people behind the scenes, we, we are, and so this is outside the party line, that, that really it's really incumbent upon us as doctors, GPs, the front line to really do our job. And that's the last thing, which is what Todd was saying and Katina has been saying, patients with symptoms must have a COVID test and they can't go to work until they get it back. We really need to focus on that. We are, that, that complacency aspect that government, with the health authorities of government is a real concern. Um, and it's gonna be the thing which is going to be um, our undoing if we don't stick to that. So can I just, please implore, spread the word, don't get it sucked into this idea that we have no cases and that people shouldn't be getting tested. This is a new world and we really need to stick with that. So that's a Cook's tour about what's going on behind the scenes because there is a fair bit um, and hopefully a lot, a lot gen general practice is really very much at the forefront of this and we are advocating very hard in that area and, uh, hope, and, and hopefully we can work, continue to work as a great team with the, with, uh, the SA Health people uh, such as those in the um, uh, webinar today. So thanks everybody. Thanks, Chris. That was a very informative update and really covered a number of the key areas that I think are really, and as you said, really pertinent issues for, for GPs. And I've posted the framework for reopening in the chat box as well for those who are interested to, to see what it says. And I mean, it's quite interesting when we think about what's happening here in South Australia and how relaxed our restrictions are here. We are, we're so fortunate that we can do so much here. And I think that's something that we've sort of become so complacent now. And that's, I think, a really good point that you've mentioned about the COVID testing and how those numbers are so low. And I know Katina and Tom, this is these are conversations that we have daily around the low numbers here in South Australia. And Tom, this is something I know that keeps you up at night and worries you <laughs> about the low the low testing rates here. And, and so I guess, what are you sort of seeing, Tom, in terms of the, the testing patterns here in, here in SA? So, <clears throat> look, I think across the board, um, there is a sense of complacency setting in and we're seeing just reductions in the, across most dem demographics. Um, a lot of our testing numbers are contributed to by um, people who are, are under um, direction to be swabbed, such as truck drivers and the cross-border community and, um, and so forth. Having said that though, um, we're still testing uh, 1,500 to 2,000 people um, a day who perhaps don't fit necessarily into those categories. So if we go back to March and April, they were the sort of numbers we were doing. So I just, encourage you all when you see patients with COVID compatible symptoms to encourage them to get a, a test um, and remind them, let them know that the turnaround time for those results are much, much quicker now. And so one of the reasons perhaps people are reluctant to go is they, you know, they don't want to be away from work for, for days and days. That won't be the case now. If you have a test in a drive through today, you'll have your result um, either that night or, or the next morning. Certainly in, in Metro Adelaide, and we're doing everything we can for all the regions. We've got lots and lots of additional couriers to get swabs up from um, 
the southeast and, and around on the west coast to try and get as many swabs completed and reported in 48 hours. Thanks, Tom. We've had a question posted as well around incidental serology testing, and, and I'm not sure whether either, either yourself or Katina would like to answer this around. Uh, the question posted around um, looking at Sydney, blood samples taken on antenatal patients revealed a 3.5 times higher in infections than proven by swabbing. Is there any epidemiological population testing like this in SA? Also, any practical things we can do with this info? So, Katina, this is probably your um, area being the yeah, professor right. in the space. Um, so we, in our uh, surveillance plan, we actually do have plans in place for when we think it's time to do serological testing of the population. And we will do a similar sort of study, um, not just taking antenates, which obviously is um, a narrow population group, um, but we've, we've got a plan in place of, of how we would do that. The reason why we haven't done it is because with our total 500 uh, and 10 or wherever we're up to, and many of those are not South Australians, so they 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 get their positive tests here and leave. So it it would be even if we were three times or three point five times the prevalence of what we knew we found, we were still looking for twelve hundred cases out of one point seven million people. So um, we think that we have got far too low prevalence to do it here. Um, and in the very low prevalence environment, we think we will find more false positives then we will find true positives. And to be honest, I ha I've seen all this today. I haven't seen how they've determined if there are any false positives amongst them, because again, their prevalence isn't very high. So I'm gonna guess that it's probably not 3.5. It's very hard to pick a false positive in a serology test. So maybe later is the answer to the question, but we're ready, should we need to, we have the plans in place. Yep. And I think that's a really critical point, Katina, is that you, you do have all the plans in place. And a lot of these plans that were all there, all ready to go, have not been needed because of the fact that we don't have that high level of community spread that we've seen in other places and particularly um, overseas as well, which is very concerning. So I'll open up as well if there's any other questions that people would like to post. I'm also happy to take questions as, uh, as well that people may have in terms of raising your hand. I can, now that I've got control of the screen sitting here at my desk, I can let you talk as well, because usually we just have the chat box only. So very happy for people to put up their hand and ask questions. Uh, we've had a, a, another question that's come in through around um, a patient who presented with COVID symptoms and they've tested negative six weeks ago, um, but no recent history of travel or a non-contact, should they be tested again? What's your advice on that, Katina? Yes, please. I mean, I understand that it, it does seem somewhat counterintuitive that we don't have COVID transmitting in the community, therefore why should we test? But actually we won't pick it up unless we do. Um, and. I think we all know the story of New Zealand of 100 days of zero cases, um, which is far more than we've actually had across Australia. And then all of a sudden, someone popping up in the middle of nowhere, and then they represented over 150 cases. So um, without anyone having done those tests, they would never have picked up at the point of 150. They would have been at the point where people are going to hospital in extremis before they're getting um, their test results. So. We would, um, we would much rather um, pick it up as it comes and as early as possible as an outbreak so that we could control it before you know, it's taken hold, before we even know it exists. Thanks, Katina. And then we've had a follow-up question as well around are we testing babies as well here in the state? And would you encourage people or encourage GPs to offer testing to young children and infants? Yes, we do. Um, and you know, it's often the case as well. People people will know when when people go to the women's and children's with un, with sick infants that a respiratory panel is a is a pretty routine um, test. Um, and and I guess it's it's up to your judgment as to whether that's what's needed a respiratory panel or just the COVID test. Um, but I would I think that's important. There are limits though, aren't there, Tom, with the nasopharyngeal that for little babies it's a it's a throat swab. But, yeah. So. Um, Yes, there are different ways of taking taking the swabs, but um, it might be of interest to people that um, uh, yesterday, for instance, there were 180 um, uh, children under the age of 10 who had swabs. So there's there's really no reason not to swab children, and 
we, we need to get that broad um, survey of the entire population to know when we, we do get our first um, case out in the community. And if we're not swabbing, as Katina said, we, we will miss that opportunity to close it down really, really early. Thanks, Tom. I'll just go to you, Chris, as well, just for a, a couple of things I was thinking that may be of interest. I know you've talked about the telehealth and um, and how we're going to see that going forward. Has there been further discussion as well about how that can be expanded into um, into sort of the non-COVID world further or other updates as well in the, in the telehealth space? Oh, yeah, very much so. It's just um, how, what is it going to look like? Um, be, being frank, um, some of government... Um, are very particularly the, the people that provide the money, finance, and treasury are somewhat skeptical about um, the you know, things like particularly telephone over video. Um, so we we're having to look at the numbers and provide good arguments about that. Um, and so that's really important from our point of view as a as GPs that we use the items appropriately and stick with the item numbers, you know, and stick with the the, the points there because what if they they're seeing um, particularly getting towards March if the numbers are looking really out that'll be really weak in the argument to continue that particularly on the telephone side of things, it probably won't be exactly the same though it won't be exactly the same items as they are um, I suspect what it's going to be is it's going to be uh, you know I think. Well, let me put it, it'll probably be linked to, probably be linked to certain things like nomination possibly and, and possibly uh, look at things like um, um, with, you know, with some limitations, because ultimately what they're trying to do is use uh, to have uh, telehealth as a, an extra tool in good general practice, but not uh, the form by which general, all general practice can be uh, provided, because as we all know, we cannot, there are things that have to be done face to face. So that's where it's looking at the moment. So there's a lot of negotiation goes. So as I said, I'm, I'm working very closely at the moment with the incoming president of RACGP um, um, and, and also with uh, the other groups like um, uh, Rural Doctors Australia and things like that. They're on these committees, particularly this tele, uh, primary care agreement group, which is really where all the major negotiations are going on. But uh, that's, there, there, is, there is a world of for telehealth beyond it. That certainly Greg Hunt is, very, very keen that it continues. It just will be how 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 it looks and will it will be exactly the way it is at the moment. Thanks, Chris. I know this is an area that we do often talk about as well as the is the future funding of general practice and whether we'll see more of a shift as well, particularly um, moving forward around um, having an identified practitioner as well and, and in the aged care space, whether you have an identified GP as part of a uh, as part of a home care model. So just wondering if there's been any further updates as well in that space, Chris. Well, 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 I, I, don't, I don't think it's a secret that that's the way it's been heading. Um, certainly things like the healthcare home model, which is still in a trial phase, but with uh, so far, uh, my understanding is that there are sort of the preliminary results from it, which are a bit uh, indeterminate about the effectiveness of it so far, um, that they have been, um, some practices have done an incredible job utilising those, those healthcare homes, for example, but others haven't. And, and I think one of the criticisms of healthcare homes has been as a model in terms of providing um, care for individuals with chronic illnesses, in theory, what it should do is actually promote alternative methods of providing that care, such as telephone video, uh, using uh, multi-D teams, um, those sort of things. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it's been limited in terms so far. Um, uh, my understanding for some people, they just have found it difficult. And certainly, despite you know, good support from organisations like the PHNs, it's just been hard to really get really penetration on that. Uh, certainly, it's still in the trial phase at the moment. Now, I think the, 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 the alternative model which is being put out there is going to be something like some sort of nomination model, which then, um, so that what would happen is a patient would nominate a, a general practice or a, a, a particular GP, at which point that would unlock access to certain other things. Um, and that, 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 that is still a long way from being determined at the moment. Uh, and so we'll have to see. But that, that's probably going to be the world that we start to look at beyond March. And uh, I, I'm very cognizant of the issues that GPs have. So I get where, the, where, the, where there are some lines in the sand for us in terms of, you know, that they really do need to understand that what, that, you know, what can be done and what can't be done. And so there is a fair bit of negotiation go between now and March. 
Thanks, Chris. And I think we're very lucky to have you as well as in your role as Vice President nationally to really push the, the GP agenda. So we're very lucky. And um, all right. Well, I think we haven't had any further questions. Uh, really, what this um, webinar was about was to try and give everyone a bit of an update of where things are at in our current system. We do have those cases coming into the hotel quarantine, predominantly being international travellers. And all the changes that have been happening from a contact tracing perspective, I think, is so important for everyone to be aware of. So thank you, for, Katina, for giving us an update in that space. And um, as has been the quote, and I've, we've heard Katina say and has been pushing the message of it is so important to get tested on the day of symptom onset and I just wanted to reiterate that as well I know that's something where we talk about you know patients are come in a day or two or three days after they've had symptoms it's so important to try and remind people to go and get tested right at the beginning of their symptom onset as well and noting you don't need a, a GP referral to a number of our drive-through clinics now Tom which is which is excellent but it, it's just so important to just remind people if they're calling up for a telehealth consult that they that they need to get tested early rather than later and results are back so quickly now that it's it's a it's a minimal inconvenience. So I just wanted to to remind everyone of that point. I know Katina, you've been you've been really um, emphasising that within three days that from symptom onset we need to be uh, well and truly on the way with contact tracing and have all those contacts in isolation. So we'll leave it there. Please feel free to send through any further topics or questions that you would like to um, like us to explore in future webinars. If we need to have a further update or if we feel that there's pertinent issues, then we can bring them up and, 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 and hopefully collaborate again with the PHN, the RACGP, the AMA, SA Pathology and SA Health uh, as, part of this, um, as part of this great collaboration and webinars that we've been doing since, since February. So anything else further, Chris, Tom, Katina from either of you three? No, thanks, Emily. Wonderful. All right. Well, we'll let everyone have a have a nice evening and enjoy the, the rest of the sunshine that's outside. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Good night. Good night.